Alright, if you have not already grabbed the Bible, now's the time. Grab yourself a Bible, grab yourself a note sheet. We're going to get started here in a hot second. I'm already dying of heat up here. It's so hot. for this morning. Thank you that you are a good God that is trustworthy, a God that we can approach and that we can know and who knows us and pursues us. God, thank you for the time that we have to spend with you right now. And God, I invite your Holy Spirit to be the one who runs this whole message. God, you be the one who steers where it goes. Give the students listening ears the discipline to be focused so that we can hear what you have for us this morning. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we are going to be in Ephesians this morning, Ephesians 3. We have been going through a series called Be Real in Ephesians. I left my phone in the back, so if at any point Be Real goes off, um, don't scream it, just super casually get up and go get my phone in the back. <laughs> Does, who in here doesn't have Be Real? Does anyone in here not have Be Real? You are living your best lives, not having to think about this stupid app that goes off. I am literally a slave to it and I can't stop. All right. So we are in Ephesians 3. We've already went through Ephesians 1 and 2. If you ever want to cap, uh, catch up on what we've taught. If you ever want to go back and listen to any of our messages, we have them all on YouTube. You can find them by going to our website or onto our app, and then it'll direct you to there, but it's pretty legit. We've got some really great messages on there. So in Ephesians 3, okay, the author of Ephesians is a guy named Paul, and he's writing letters to a church that's in Ephesus. And essentially, we're opening his mail and reading these letters because what applies for them, the New Testament church, we are still a part of that. Like, the division of Old Testament church to the New Testament church is simply the arrival of Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 8, but I need you to get your pens ready because I'm going to have you mark up in your Bible. So starting in verse 8, it says, this grace, we're already going to stop. You can circle grace and put Holy Spirit because that's what verses 1 through 7 are talking about. The grace that is given to him is the Holy Spirit. And it says, the least of all saints, talking about himself, because he doesn't think highly of himself, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery for ages in God who created all things. OMG. This is where the message translation would come in really helpful. Ultimately, what he's saying is that the Holy Spirit, starting in verse 10, has been given to him and to all of us so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heaven. This is according to his eternal purpose, like the Lord had this planned, accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, in God, through the Holy Spirit, because Jesus came to this earth, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So then if we jump down to verse 14, 
This is where Paul really dives in. He says, for this reason, because I've been given the Holy Spirit, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Pause. Oh my gosh. If someone wrote me a letter with all of these ginormous words, I'd be like, maybe just send me a quick text next time. Right? Like, he has a lot of words that maybe sound confusing. So we're just going to start with, this is simply about the Holy Spirit. The people who are reading this chapter, this letter from Paul, they are familiar with who the Holy Spirit is. And you might not know, but the Holy Spirit didn't just come onto the scene after Jesus died on the cross and was sent back up to heaven. That the Holy Spirit was actually at the beginning of creation. Genesis chapter 1 already tells us the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the Spirit and Jesus and God, the Holy Trinity, has been around since literally the beginning of any time that we could even measure. And then in Exodus, the way that you would be able to see the Spirit is when he did cool things, like as he was leading the um, Israelites in the wilderness, an entire ginormous group of Israelites, up to a million and a half people wandering through the desert, they were led by a pillar of fire at night and by a cloud by day. And those, those are the kind of like super cool, magical ways that the Holy Spirit would show up. But it wasn't necessarily for the individual, but it was for the group. Because in order to be like in contact with the Holy Spirit, you'd have to be a pretty special person, especially in the Old Testament. Like Moses being able to have contact with God, having the ability to have conversations with God. Holy Spirit is where that came in. It gave them the opportunity to have relationship with God, but it wasn't for everyone. So in Acts, which is right after the Gospels, it's right after the story of Jesus, Jesus goes back to heaven, but he tells them, I'm leaving you a gift. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit so that you aren't just living on your own with a God that's far away from you, but with a God that lives within you. We get to have a Holy Spirit that lives inside of our hearts, that lives inside of our bodies, that lives inside of our minds, so that we don't just have a pillar of fire leading us from the outside. We have that leading us from the inside. And so as Paul is talking to the Ephesians here, he's telling them, I am praying for the Father, that he works through you because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so in verse 16, we will reiterate. It says, I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So today I wanna to pose the question of how is my heart how is my body an acceptable vessel to have the Holy Spirit be in? Am I giving him the space to do work? Am I giving him space to make room and to do incredible things through me? You see, I grew up with my dad who was an architect, but only for like the rich and bougie. So I've seen some pretty epic houses designed in my lifetime. My dad actually designed one of Tony Hawk's houses. And in his backyard, he actually had two pools put in. He had one for like a real pool and then a, one that you can go skating in as a ramp. I've seen slides put in instead of stairs. I've seen hidden rooms that are only accessible by secret doorways that my dad puts in. But there's actually, the Lord is so good and he works on TikTok because I was on it yesterday and he showed me this most incredible house. Okay, we're gonna put some pictures up here. Can you put them up for me? Okay, look, it's a $2.1 million house in Texas that's all unicorns, you guys. Literally, I mean, look at this outside with this giant unicorn. That's what you walk through to get into the house. And then you have these bedrooms that are like unicorns are just straight jumping out of the wall. Go to the next slide. 
A bathtub with a unicorn just hanging out with you, watching, like, what's happening? The whole kitchen? Like, insanity. There's one more slide with just a few more bonkers things. Look at this kid's playroom. And the pool has, like, at the bottom of your pool is a bunch of rainbow magic unicorn stuff. So to be clear, you can go back to the be real slide. So to be clear, homes can be pretty freaking legit, right? But at the same time, there's some pretty gross houses out there. For my 18th birthday, um, I got to stay at a friend's cabin in Big Bear. Me and a group of friends got to go up there. And we got there super late at night. And you know, like, if you've ever rented an Airbnb or visited someone else's house somewhere, and you're like, oh, let's go check out all the rooms and see what's in here. And so we're going in through all the rooms, and then I get into the bathroom, and I turn the light on, and I pull the shower curtain back. No joke, like 20 full-size wolf spiders in the bathtub! And I was like, ah, we might have to burn their house down! Like, I don't know what to do next! It was hideous. Like, but then there's also, like, if you come into my home, it's pretty well lived in. It's not often picked up. It's picked up once a month for our house cleaner to clean it. And that's it. After that, it's like, all right, everybody put everything back and now we're just gonna be messy again. My sister's house, because we're literally the most opposite people on the planet, no matter what day you walk into her house, it's like a model home. Every time, every time. It would be a dream to see her house be messy. And she's like, oh, I have to clean up for the birthday party. And I was like, what would you even pick up? Oh, there's lint. Stupid. Anyway, so, like, homes are all so unique in the same way that we are unique. In the same way that we can all be our own special, set-apart vessels for the Holy Spirit. And so, we're going to ask, how do I make my heart his home? How do I make my heart his home, the Holy Spirit, and we are going to literally just walk through some rooms in a house. So the first room that I want to talk about is the attic. My mind is the attic. So I found this story from 2019. This family bought a home in France, like you do, and they have an attic in this home that they purchased. And as they're cleaning things out and getting prepared to move in, they find this just casual painting up there. So they take it to like some professionals, they get it appraised, they send it to auction. And this random painting in their attic that they found that they didn't own, they didn't pay for anything other than the house, but because it's in their attic, they get to keep all this money went for $171 million. Just, you know, you ever go clean out your attic and find $171 million laying around? Like, wouldn't be mad about it. But the attic is where we typically put things that maybe can be treasures. I think sometimes we see in movies, you go up to the attic and you find like your grandmother's wedding dress and it's like, oh, it's so delightful. Or you find like a trunk that has a bunch of hidden and creepy things inside of it. Like an attic is a place that isn't necessarily somewhere that you're wandering to all the time, but there's a lot of important things that can be stored there. There are treasures that can be stored there. And for us, our mind, we can have a lot stored up there that maybe not a lot of other people have access to. Our attic, our mind, is something that we own and that we control. And sometimes we can use that ownership and that control to maybe be a little overwhelmed with anxiety or with stress or with the pressure of wanting to please everyone or with just not being a disappointment. But that's not necessarily stuff that everyone else knows about. It's something that we have stored away in our minds, but it affects us deeply. I don't know if you guys have ever struggled with anxiety. I don't struggle with it in the way that maybe a lot of you guys do, but I've struggled with depression. 
I struggled with not being able to get out of a pit with horrible thoughts that maybe you're like, I don't feel like I have a handle on this. I can't control what my mind is doing and where it's going. But the Lord, he calls us to not have anxiety. He calls us to not have worry. He holds our today and our yesterday and our future in his hands. He tells us in Matthew about how he has already taken care of all the plants outside, all the birds, all the things that you're like, what do these things even do all day? And yet, for some way, for some reason, the Lord provides for them. He says, I'm going to provide for you even more because you're so much more important to me than every other piece of creation. But something that's really helped me on my journey of being able to control my thoughts is a passage in Philippians. Philippians 4, 8 tells us this. My friends, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. So when I have like a specific thought that I'm struggling with, when I'm feeling like a failure, when I feel like nothing I can do can measure up and I'm so frustrated with myself, I can start with, all right, Let's take this circumstance and let's pull out what's true about it. Not the what ifs, not my assumptions of what other people think, but what is true. I am a child of God and no matter how many times I mess up up, or how big my disappointments are, I have a God that's never giving up on me. Even if I feel like everyone else is, even if I feel like I don't fit in, I fit in with him. That is true. I can look at things that are noble. That means being the bigger person. If I'm like, okay, well, I'm so much better than that person at least, that's not noble. Being the bigger person says, I'm gonna take this mantle upon myself. I'm gonna have ownership over this situation. And I know that if I have the Holy Spirit coming alongside of me and helping me do this checklist, I can have some huge success here. And being able to say, you come into the attic of my mind. You can dwell inside of my heart. You can change the things that I've let be stored in my mind. You have the power to get me through these incredible ways of thinking, changing our thought processes. And a lot of times the things that we put inside of our attic in this specific room can be affected by the next room that we're gonna take a tour on today. Our next room is the dining room. This is the feast, my feast in the dining room. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm done with whitewater, I'm like, can I have some real food, please? Like, who doesn't love eating McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and Chipotle and Starbucks all the dang time? But you come a point where you're like, my body is craving real things. That is real things. Those aren't real things. I mean, here's the thing. I'm an adult, so I can choose what I make for dinner and lunch and breakfast and every snack in between. And I personally don't dig fruit. It's just not my thing. And only a few vegetables. But here's the thing. As much as I dislike those things, and I'm a little bit over food by the end of Whitewater, Thanksgiving, that's a feast I can look forward to. On my Thanksgiving plate, I literally only put mashed potatoes and chicken. I ain't got room for nothing else. Corn, cranberry sauce, what's that, green bean casserole? Like, no thanks. I make my own choices. Half potatoes, like three pieces of tiny chicken, or of turkey. What we feed ourselves matters. What we feed ourselves matters. What we choose to feast on, what we choose to put in front of our bodies and consume. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it's pretty cool that in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a bunch of I am statements. Two of those statements about who he is is that he's the bread of life and that he's living water. Two things that every civilization has and can't live without. So if you 
If you've ever heard the phrase, like, a smile can be translated in a million languages, like, no matter what, if you go somewhere, you don't have to know the language, but a smile is priceless. It's communicable. It's something that you can give to someone without having to know their language. But bread and water are the most basic of sustenances. Every culture has some sort of version of bread and every human alive needs water to be alive. And so the statement that the Lord is making here is that we need him. More than just a Thanksgiving feast, more than just a fast food marathon, our Lord is saying, I can give you what your body actually needs. Matthew 12 tells us that out of the heart is what the mouth speaks. And the way that we're feeding our heart is in that dining room. That dining room that we let the Holy Spirit dwell in. We can hopefully be packing it in with good things. In 1 Peter, it tells us this very interesting verse. It says, rid yourselves then of all evil. All evil. No more lying or hypocrisy or jealousy or insulting language. But like newborn babies, always thirst for the pure spiritual milk. So that by drinking it, you may grow up and be saved. As junior hires, as newer believers, like you might know scripture because you've gone to church your whole life, but the application of that can get kind of complicated. Friendships can get kind of complicated. School can get kind of complicated. Like it's crazy. And so being able to say, I'm gonna come to the Lord and I'm gonna let him raise me up like a baby, giving myself grace, that's important, being able to do that. And so the Lord promises that he will give us the tools that we need if we allow ourselves to sit in the dining room with the Holy Spirit and feast on scripture and feast on what will actually fill us. But even in the best intentions, sometimes we mess up. Even if we're trying to put treasures in our attic, even if we're trying to feed ourselves with best things at the dining room table. Our final room that we're going to wander through here is our bedroom or our closet. My hidden and open sins. The closet or bedrooms. My son has the most hideous bedroom of all time. It's people probably should be quarantined from going inside of there. Like it's literally the worst. There's dishes everywhere. There's syrup bottles under his bed, but he's a grown person and I just let him live his best life and hopefully we'll charge him rent really soon. Anyway, our bedrooms are where we feel the most comfortable. Our bedrooms is where we can kind of just do what we want. Some of you might have to clean your room regular, be, regularly because your parents enforce that, but like me, I grew up in a bedroom that had like a foot and a half deep of clothes. Like you just walked in, you stepped all over it. My windowsill was decorated with every chewing gum that I had when I went on a date with my boyfriend at the time. I was like, oh, that was a special night. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Why do young people do things that they do? I don't know. You'll ask those questions later when you're an adult as well. But our bedroom is where we have the opportunity to be our most authentic selves. And sometimes that means that we can do maybe things that we don't think other people are gonna be affected by. Maybe that means that we're able to have that self-hate just fester in the bedroom. We just make it messy. We have deceptiveness. We have lying. We have manipulation. Maybe some of you guys, if you struggle with porn or sexual addiction in some sort of way, and you think that's not affecting anyone, I'd venture to say that you're very wrong. And that if you have a place like that, in your heart, you're not really giving a lot of space for the Holy Spirit to work. That maybe we need to clean our rooms and clean out our closets. Mark 7 tells us this, for from the inside from your heart come the evil ideas which lead you to do immoral things. And you might not do all of these things, but a single one of them is sin. To rob, kill, commit adultery, be greedy, I'm sure we've all done that, do all sorts of evil things. Deceit, that's like lying, indecency, have you seen what some of you guys tell jokes about? 
Jealousy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from inside you and make you unclean. We are making a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit unclean when we participate in those types of things. And so we can ask the Lord, like, clean, clean me. Like, there's a psalm that says, create in me a pure heart, God. We can invite the Holy Spirit to come alongside us. And Marie Kondo, our bedrooms for the Holy Spirit. Like, straight organizational magic. But ultimately, Paul finishes out here. In verse 17, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth in God, of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. No matter where you are on your journey, no matter what size house you have, no matter your bedrooms, your dining room, your attic, any of those spaces, before we can even have the Holy Spirit make a dwelling in our home, we need the foundation of Christ's love. My foundation is the love of Christ. It describes it here as wide and deep and high. It's every which way too immeasurable for us to even grasp. Romans 8 tells us, I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love. Death or life or angels or other heavenly rulers or powers, present, future, world, or the worlds below, there's nothing in all creation that will ever, ever, ever be able to separate us from the love of God. Surrendering our life to Jesus is step one. That is foundational and it's absolutely imperative. So the question and the challenge I want to leave with you guys today is what needs a remodel in your home? What needs a remodel in your home? Some of you may have lived through remodels in your life. Maybe there was a leaky pipe in your house and you wound up getting a whole new like washroom or a whole new kitchen. Here's the thing about remodels. They look beautiful when they're done, but they're a hot mess going through them. And they're difficult, and they're messy, and you're pulling things apart. As a matter of fact, here's a couple, vid here's a video of some of your favorite leaders tearing apart my stairs. They're helping remodel. They're just tearing stuff apart. It was a mess. It was disgusting. They were ripping carpet up. They're ripping banisters out. They're just like pounding away at things. It was hideous. It was horribly unsafe. None of them were licensed to do what they did. But you know what? When we ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, we need to give him the permission to remodel it, to make uncomfortable seasons where we learn how to be a better dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We need to be able to give him that permission and that space. So that is my question for you guys. What room needs to be remodeled? What part of your life needs to be remodeled? We need to invite the Holy Spirit and say, let me pray. Lord, thank you for another service to just sit before you and to learn and to hear your scripture, God. I ask that you will speak to the minds of these students. God, give them direction. Give them that invitation to have your Holy Spirit do the most magical things from the inside out. Thank you for dwelling in us. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, there are prayer cards.